Hello again and welcome to another Mordian Glory Warhammer 40k video. Today's episode will be a tournament after action report. That's right, it's time for some more dispatches from the front lines. And oh boy, do I have a spicy meatball for your viewing pleasure today. You see, recently I travelled to Adepticon and I've already done an after action report on the singles tournament that I did there. And if you've not seen that, don't worry, I'll make sure that there is a link to it at the end of this video. But that was not the only tournament I took part in whilst I was in the land of freedom and democracy, America. You see, I also took part in a completely new kind of tournament, one that I've not covered on this channel before. I took part in a doubles tournament. That's right, myself was going in there with a thousand points. I had a teammate each round who also had a thousand points and we would drive the enemies of the emperor from the field of battle together, arms linked. And it was a ton of fun. And it was a really interesting and unique experience because I got to fight alongside some armies that I regularly face off against, but this time, we would be working together and it gave me new insights and new lessons were learned. And so with all of that said, let's not mess around any further. Let's get this hype train rolling and charge right into today's episode. As a tradition, let us start off with a few thank yous. Firstly, I want to say a big thank you to Adepticon for running the event. Like with their singles, it was really, really high quality. Adepticon has totally stepped up this year. They've overhauled the terrain. They've overhauled the missions. They've really brought it in line with what the community has come to expect from a competitive 40k event. So big well done to Adepticon for rolling with the changes and massively improving the quality of their events year on year. Of course, I want to say a big thank you to all of our opponents. Every single round we played into two other people and they were all gents. Some of them came to play, some of them came for fun, but all of them had the right attitude and every single game was very gentlemanly and really, really fun to engage in. But I want to say the biggest thank you to my teammates, Salty Simon, Chris and Mark. It was so much fun traveling to Adepticon with a great group of guys. And we've known each other for years and we've been battling against each other for that time. But now we got to fight alongside each other and it just made the event all that more special. So thank you to all of my teammates just for being a great group of guys and for also putting up with me for four or five days. But with all of that said, now let's get into the video proper and we'll begin with the list overview. As per usual, I have done a separate video which has gone through this list in detail. And I'll make sure there's a link to that down in the description below. So I'll just give you a brief overview of what was in my army. Essentially, it was the green Mordian half of my 2000 point mechanized army. I had a tank commander with Grand Strategist, a Battle Cannon, Laz Cannon and Heavy Bolters and a Storm Bolter and a Hunter Killer Missile. I also had another Lehman Russ and this time it was an Exterminator with a Hull Heavy Bolter, Sponson Multi Melters and then a Heavy Stubber and a Hunter Killer Missile. And for the last bit of fire support, I had a basilisk because you can't go wrong with some indirect fire, something that guard does well and something that other factions can sometimes struggle with. I then had three units of Catachans, each one inside a Chimera. The Chimeras had a various assortment of weapons. It was all WYSIWYG, so there were some with multi-lasers, some with heavy bolters, but by and large, they were all DACA Chimeras. There weren't any flamers knocking around, apart from, of course, the Catachans firing theirs out of the, fi out of the firing deck. And then I had a Scout Sentinel, and I had a Cyclops Demolition Vehicle. The idea behind this list was that it was to support my allies. You see, I had a thousand points of mech guard and then Chris, one of my teammates who had brought Dirty Tau to the singles event, uh, used the other half of my 2000 point list and he had a thousand points of the Steel Legion mech guard. And the reason we did that is because we wanted to have a team theme because uh, you get lots of like soft score for that and we wanted to be Team Imperium. So the idea was that the two guard armies would bring some indirect fire, some long range firepower and also bring some 
some mass. We know we've got lots of bodies in those chimeras and this would pair really well with our teammates who had more elite army. So to give you an idea of what was the other guys were running, Chris had a tank commander, he had a Lemus battle tank, he had a manticore, and he had three armored fist squads, and he had a sentinel, and then, so he was providing more bulk, more bodies, and then Simon was running a very elite Grey Knight's army, he had three Dread Knights, a Grandmaster of the Dread Knight, and five Terminators, and then Mark was running a similar elite army, he had uh, two Dreadnoughts, he had a Red Knight of Dreadnoughts, I should say, he then had a Dark Shroud, and he had Azrael, in a unit of bodyguards and he had a tech priest and he had some scouts as well and so they were running very elite armies like simon had like nine models in his army i think mark had about a dozen models in his army and so they were going to provide some of the punch of the elite some of the quality whilst the guard provided the quantity and so we would have the best of both worlds well at least that was the plan but i guess we'll find out how it all did when we get into the games. But before we do that, there is one more bit of pre-game preamble, preamble if you will, and that is the lay of the land. This is the area video I like to talk about how competitive the event was, what kind of terrain, just sort of set the tone for the entire tournament. Now, overall, I would describe Adepticon teams as competitive. Now, some people might be surprised by that because Adepticon teams does generally tout itself as a more friendly event they actually have loads and loads of soft score you've got soft score for the law for your army for the themes of your each individual army the themes of the armies as they come together so for example do you just have a hodgepodge of the best factions right now or have you all brought like matching and cohesive armies or is there a theme like there was one uh, four-man team there where they had world eaters death guard thousand sons and then emperor's children and they sort of had the four chaos gods represented you get a huge amount of points for things like display boards and all that kind of stuff so there's loads and loads of soft score but at the end of the day it's still a tournament and there is still a prize for the team which gets the best in-game score. So there's essentially two first place prizes at Adepticon teams. You've got best overall, which includes all the sportsmanship, the theming, the paint jobs, the, the lore, the whole, all the whole thing. But there's still a first place prize for those that basically sack all of that off and just go all gas, no breaks. So what you tend to find happens is you have half of the teams turn up and they are there to just have a good time they've spent maybe a year or so planning their team thing team theme they've got matching t-shirts sometimes they've got matching costumes you saw lots of people like body paint and stuff like people like with their like orc outfits on all this kind of stuff and then you have the other half of the teams which have definitely gone there to win it and there's nothing wrong with that there's no lambastation or shade being thrown there at the end of the day it is a tournament we are there to play there are winners there are losers so overall, you tend to find that half of your games are quite fun and quite narrative, and the other half you tend to find are proper games, for lack of a better term, of matched play, competitive play, 40k. Everyone's really nice, but some of the lists you come across are more spicy than others, shall we say. Now that covers the attitudes and the competitiveness of the event, but there's one last thing we need to talk about, and that is terrain. I have a real hard on for terrain. I think it can make or break an event. In previous years, Adepticon has used player place terrain, so that I've not been a huge fan of, and they've clearly had some feedback about this because this was the first year when they were using terrain maps, standard set terrain, and they were using the GW Leviathan Tournament companion terrain. They always use either setup number one or setup number four on each table, and they use these standard combinations of missions in there as well. Personally, I think this made a huge, huge difference, and I think it was a big improvement. I know some people love player place terrain, and I'm not here to argue with them. Everyone does have their personal preferences, but... I think it made the tournament a lot more enjoyable. There was none of this messing around of, oh, how do I even use the player place? A lot of people aren't familiar with how to do it. Some people just lose games because they're not sure how to place the terrain properly. It meant that there were less things to worry about and more ways of just getting into the games quickly and having fun. Speaking of which, it's time for the part you've all been waiting for. Let's get into the battles and we'll start off with game number one. Now, in this first round, 
I paired up with Chris. Every person in the team had to pair up with each other at least once. And the thinking was we would have the guard players pair up round one, get that out of the way. And then every round going forward, we could initiate our master plan of having the guards supporting one of the more elite armies. Our opponents were using a combination of Necrons and Votan, and they had come to play. Proper gents, don't get me wrong, but when you look across at the enemy Necron list, and there's the equivalent of three Catans and a big blob of Indostructo Wraiths, you get the idea that these guys aren't messing around. In total, their list consisted of a Nightbringer, a Transcendent Catan, and a Luminor Seraz, who was described to us as a pseudo Catan, who does have lone optive whilst he's near other Necron units. And then there was a big unit of Wraiths with the five plus feel no pain. On the Votan side, there there was a huge unit of the Votan Terminators led by a Karl. And then there were two Sagittars with Hearthkin inside. And then there was a unit of the Pioneers. And there may have been one or two other bits knocking around, but that was the bulk of their army. Now, the mission for round one was the ritual and the deployment was sweeping engagement. I turned to Chris and said, oh, I don't like the ritual. I've got a really bad track record on it. I never seem to win it. And Chris looked at me and went, okay, well, why don't we just bum rush them? I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, look at our list, Tim. How many tanks we have? I was like, we've got like 14 vehicles. He went, exactly. How much anti-tank do they really have? Two Sagittars and a couple of Catan? Anything else we can screen out, right? And I was like, Chris, you're, you're, you're in command here. You're in command here. So we initiated the Chris protocol, which was put everything on the line and then bum rush it forward and just try and overwhelm them with armor. That was our plan. And I went to Simon, who was playing on the table, who was our team captain, and said, Simon, Chris and I are going to try something weird. It's going to be kind of wacky. We don't know if it's going to work. Assume we're going to lose. And then if we win, it'll be a surprise. And Simon went, understood. <laughs> That's like, that, I mean, Chris is like, well, if we lose, we lose. It doesn't matter. But if we... If we've got armor domination, let's try and leverage that advantage. And I was like, God damn it. Yes, absolutely. And this was a real mind blowing moment for me. And kind of, a, I want to say a big thank you to Chris for this, because I, I definitely realized now that I'd fallen into a bit of a trap with the ritual where I'd gone in there kind of like self voodooing myself going, well, if I'm going to lose this game, I'm, I'm going to lose it. You know, I'm never very good at this mission, blah, 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 blah. So in the end, our deployment ended up being all six chimeras on the line. Um, of course, they've got like scout move and everything with the cash chance inside them. So uh, we put them on the line bit in a way where they could scout move defensively if they needed to. And then behind them, we had all of our Lehman Russes. And essentially the Lehman Russes were hidden behind line of sight blocking terrain. But with the ability to turn one, move out so that they were going straight down the main firing lane to the objective in the middle. The one that you've got to use for the ritual. As for our opponents, they put the big unit of Votan Terminators in the sky. And they also put the Votan Pioneers in the sky. And everything else actually started on the board, including their Nightbringers and their Catan, because they were in the Hypercrypt cult. So it didn't really matter if they were on the board or off the board, they'll be teleporting around one way or another. Now, there were two other quirks to this mission. The first one was the Adepticon twist. Every mission had an Adepticon twist. Um, some of them were more impactful than others. But in this one, the twist was you couldn't hold an objective. You couldn't physically hold an objective unless you had a unit from each player's uh, team on it. So what I mean by that is I couldn't hold an objective with just one of my Chimeras. I'd have to have one of my Chimeras. Then Chris would have to have one of his units on there as well. But Chris and I realized a bit of a loophole and we checked this with our opponents and uh, they were like, yep, that totally works. We were both running guard and we were both running mech guard. So I turned to Chris and Chris turned to me and we were like, can we put my Katachans in his Chimeras and his Katachans in my Chimeras so that we can drive onto the objective and get out and hold the objective? And the opponents were like, yes, you can. That is genius. <laughs> so we had uh, we had a bit of an advantage there. But bear in mind that it's not as strong as advantage as it may look. Because in Met Guard, you don't want to get out of your Chimeras too early. You want to make sure you're staying in your Chimeras till at least sort of turn three, except for some exceptional circumstances. Because you don't have that much OC that you can start throwing it away. The other twist was how going first worked. The captains would roll off. And the captain that one would decide which of the two tables 
would go first. Now, as a result of this, I ended up going first in every single game this round. A little bit of a foreshadow, a little bit of a spoiler alert, but I ended up going first in every single round this tournament because what would happen is Simon would win the roll-off and he wouldn't want to go first because he's Grey Knight and I wouldn't be paired with him. So he would pick us to go first because Simon's Grey Knights want to go second so that they can start picking up and jumping around early on. Or the enemy captain would win and go, oh, well, we don't want those Grey Knights to go first because they want to be jumping up and down. So we'll pick the Grey Knights to go first. And that happened whenever I was paired with Simon. So little twist of fate here, but I actually ended up going first every single time in this tournament. And it wasn't even, you know, Skinwalker Mordian that was making it happen. It was actually just the, the funny way that our teams had worked out on how the, the going first worked in this tournament. But with all of that covered, we then get into the game. So turn one, we go first and we scout move forward pretty much all of the chimeras and we go high progressive. We send two down the right flank because we want to go after a Sagittar that we can see because we've got bring it down for one of our secondaries. And then we send two down the middle and then we send two down the left flank. But they're all fairly close to each other because there's no point in going out onto the extreme flanks because it's the ritual. Everything basically focuses on the middle. Moving up behind this essentially wall of chimeras, we have our tanks. And so we push forward with uh, the one of the sentinels in the middle and then we bring out one of the battle tanks so it can just get a nice line of fire onto the middle objective whilst uh, it won't see anything this turn but next and if anything moves on there it'll get the four rerolls and it'll have the lethals and it's got the range where we're not too worried about the sagittas laser rays and stuff like that now we end up opening fire with the manticore the basilisk and uh, two or three chimeras and we're just able to bring down the Sagittar. I think it comes down to uh, Katachan opening the top hatch of a Chimera and they're like, let's rock! <laughs> and it's like burning the la the singular last wound off the Sagittar and managing to get the points. But that's good because it got three points to bring it down and we are now uh, on the middle objective. We pooped out an extra objective as per the ritual and we've begun our plan of Operation Armor Rush, the Blitzkrieg, as you will. Now, one last thing to mention about our first turn is there had been a bit of umming and ahhing about whether we screen out the backfield or if we just sort of let it happen. And this is because the Necron Hypercrypt can deep strike three inches away. What we ended up doing is using our artillery and placing it in such a way that they couldn't deep strike in nine inches away, but they could deep strike in three inches if they wanted to. This was a calculated risk because we knew if they deep striked in three inches, there was a chance that they would drop in a Catan, maybe blow up uh, one of our artillery pieces, but they can't charge after they've dropped that close. And we thought, well, if they want to drop one lone Catan into our backfield, it's going to get turned around and shot at by four Liebling Russes and one to two artillery pieces, depending on what survives. And I don't care how tough those things are, they're not going to survive that. And so we left our backfield open to the three-inch deep strike, and we even said this to our opponent, we were like, look, if you... Because our opponent was trying to, like, voodoo us a little bit in a, in a sort of a friendly, banterous sort of way. He was like, oh, I could deep strike in three inches there. And we went, and we went you know what? If you want to drop three inches into the kill box, is what we called the backfield, we were like, be our guest. So there's a few voodoo rays flying back, <laughs> a bit of mind games fly, flying back and forth uh, over this game. But it was it was actually a ton of fun, like a will they, won't they kind of sort of moment. Going into our opponent's turn one, it turned out that they won't they because they didn't want to drop in an isolated unit and just get it blown off the table so instead what they did is they did the right thing and they pushed forward to the middle because remember this is the ritual so it doesn't really matter about the backfield it's about controlling the middle objective and pooping things out so they moved a transcendent katan and they moved um a Luminor Saraz into the middle and one of them pooped out an objective and then Transcendent Catan went to like laser beam and charge uh, one of the Chimeras and he, he successfully did this. He tried to kill both but uh, I popped smoke on the Chimera and so the vindictive glare of the uh, Catan or whatever it is that the um, the Transcendent Catan does um, didn't didn't do anything to the uh, to the Chimera, and then it went in and killed it in combat. So fair play, it sort of damaged it a little bit. But I think he was hoping to sort of destroy one at range, destroy one in combat. But he ended up settling for just basically killing one Chimera. Um, they did manage to poop out uh, an objective, but that was really their turn. Um, the 
Berserkers did counter charge the two Chimeras on uh, our right flank. I should say that the Rotom player did have a unit of those Berserker guys. And uh, he multi-charged both Chimeras. And because he split his attacks, he really, really badly damaged both. But he didn't kill either one. He brought one down to one wound and one down to three wounds. Um, I think it might have been better if he'd just gone after the one Chimera, benefit of hindsight, because Chimeras don't degrade, so it's fine. And we've got Flamers and stuff, so we were kind of happy to sort of stay in combat. And I think we'd um, we'd had an infantry squad get out for uh, for one reason or another. And so when they when they had moved in, we'd overwatch them with two flamers because you can't do that from when you're inside the chimera, which had uh, which had killed one of them and it, like injured another one. And then uh, when they charged us, one of the chimeras had run over one in in combat. Uh, so there's only like three left. And I said to Chris, like, well, I'm kind of happy to stay in combat here. I can get the infantry squad back inside the chimera, and we can have two chimeras with lethal hits with flamers at the firing deck, just firing into into combat and that should be fine we'll just stay still and we'll just do that and to be honest that attitude kind of sums up our turn too the enemy had pushed forward aggressively we had high priority targets in the middle and we had things that were threatening us on the flanks as well but we had already secured that middle objective so there wasn't really any need for us to start driving forward any further so the only aggressive move that we made on our turn two, our move was very quick, is we took one Chimera and we just yeeted it forward. And you'll see why we did this in a moment. And then it came over to the shooting. On the right flank, the Flamers, the Chimeras, it was multi-lasers, Storm Bolters, Heavy Bolters, Laz Gun Arrays, Flamers, goddamn everything we, kept, we could throw at them. The kitchen sink went into the Berserkers. We stayed in combat, bear man. So we were hitting at minus one. But we stayed in combat with them. And thanks to the lethal hits and the Flamers, the fact that there was only sort of three of them left, we were able to actually kill the Berserkers, which was nice. Um, to the advantages with, with Met Guard and with sort of Flamers and Chimeras and that stuff is you don't have to fall back. If you fall back, you lose all the firepower from that unit. But if you stay in and you risk it for a chocolate biscuit, you can actually uh, get some good results and sort of burn and shoot your way out of combat if you need to. But the real firework display was in the middle. Facing down the Catan and the Pseudo Catan, we had an infantry squad, Two Chimeras, a Sentinel, four Lehman Russes, and the fire support from two artillery pieces. And we blew them away. People say Gatan are tough, and they are. But they can't stand up to that level of firepower. First thing we did is put the Exterminator into the Ascendant Gatan because. Even though the extra AP might seem like a little bit of a waste, we had a lot of chip damage coming from like las guns and stuff. And this thing could have benefited from cover potentially, so we didn't want it to be on a three-up save. The exterminator went in there and it did some really good damage. Remember, most of the stuff has, has stayed still because we lined all up to make the middle basically a bit of a killing zone in our turn two. The exterminator went in with withering hail, with support from the central staying recon and was able to actually take about uh, four wounds off the Catan. We stuck a couple of the auto cannon uh, shots through and it sort of halved them and then it struggled on its feel no pains there. The Catan did tank the multi mouths, it tanked everything else. And then the Chimera started going and the Sentinels. And we'd fire one Chimera and these things had like lethal hits and they would be like just getting auto wounds. And look, you can halve damage, but halving damage of one still makes it a one damage thing and with the Catan sort of rules. And so we we chipped it down, we chipped it down, we chipped down. And the last thing to kill the Catan was the Sentinel with its Laz Cannon and its Hunter Killer Missile. And it was, I have to say, the Hunter Killer Missiles that did a lot of work this time round. Uh, because we just had so many of them. We had, what, like six or seven hunter killer missiles just, like, thrown into the middle. It's like, Eagle 1, Fox 2, Eagle 2, Fox 2, Eagle 3, Fox 2. It's like, psh, 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 just firing the missiles forward. And we brought down the first Catan, and then Illuminor Seraz, they described him as pseudo Catan. He's tough, but he's nowhere near as tough as a Catan. And then he went down to the combined firepower of both tank commanders. Uh, they were hitting on fours, um, and we did have to, I think there was a, 
had like a little squad that was able to get like fields of fire on him so that we were able to get the extra AP going and stuff. Because uh, we had the CP to burn for it. But long story short, we completely cleared that middle. And I would say that turn two, we kind of broke the back of the Necrons. They still had the Nightbringer and they still had the Wraiths. But remember that Chimera I mentioned earlier? We kind of cooked the Wraiths a little bit because we threw a Chimera into them. And Wraiths are just terrible against vehicles. And so the Wraiths rolled all their dice and did like one wound to a Chimera. Maybe two. They got like one wound through. And so it went over to our opponent's turn two. And they're like, okay, well, we've got a Nightbringer that can go into the middle. And the Votan are kind of trying to sit on objectives and stuff. And then we've got the reinforcements, the Terminator blob. And that was really all they had to play. And because we've screened them out, and the Votan can't come within three inches. Basically, the Terminators were forced to deploy way out on the right flank because our Chimeras have been sort of screening back uh, sort of around there. You know, the ones that have been fighting with the Berserkers and stuff. Um, and so our opponents turn two essentially consisted of the Terminators coming down destroying the two injured chimeras and the Catan moving into the middle of the board and the, the Nightbringer, I should say, moving into the middle of the board and killing a chimera. And that was it. He he He's the one that does like the vindictive glare or whatever it is. And he, he moved in, killed a chimera. But that was really all they had. Their firepower was really diminished and their ability to do damage was really down now that they basically lost half of a Necron army. Comes over to our turn three and our firepower... We, we really noticed the fact we didn't have the Hunter Killer Missiles, uh, but we were able to essentially get the Nightbringer down and throw another Chimera into the Wraiths, which screwed them over again. The first Chimera that we'd done it with um, had actually been destroyed by the Votan Sagittar with like its LAS beams and everything. Uh, opponent did really good on the damage there. And then, but, but, but that, by the end of our turn three, the Necron player was down to a unit of wraiths that are again tied up in combat. And there's just, <laughs> and we've got plenty more Chimeras, we can keep doing it. And the Votan player is down to a Sagittar, a unit of Pioneers, a unit of Hearthkin, and a unit of Terminators that are really just out of the fight at this point because they're just waddling forward really slowly. And then, yeah, their, their turn three, you know, the Catan was dead, so the wraiths have just got. The Wraiths are just sort of, they move into the middle, they fall back into the middle of the board to try and like hold it and, and do stuff. But at this point, they're essentially feeding us one unit at a time and we've just set up a gun line. And so over the course of turn four, we table the Necron player, we, we take all the Wraiths out in one go. And then turn five, we start working on the Votan. And by the end of the game, uh, the only things that our opponents had left was one unit of Hearthkin sat on the home objective and about half of their Terminators. That's all they had left. And it was just drive forward, overwhelm them with armor, and then just set up just a furious level of firepower. And because of this, we were consistently on the objectives, on the primary. Because of the fact that we had really focused one player down, um, it meant that they were struggling to actually have remember they had to have two units on an objective to hold it and so they were sh really struggling to do that because the Necrons are kind of like bum rush forward themselves but the voters hadn't been able to keep up um, I hear they are great sprinters over short distances um, and so the final result was they, they, they scored fine on their secondaries but they basically got no primary in fact they actually did get zero primary over the course of the game and so the final score was a bit of an eye-watering 27 to team xenos and 93 to his imperial guard the emperor's true finest and they were using points differential for the scoring similar to wtc so that meant that we got a 20-0 win on our board and even though simon and mark lost their game they didn't lose it by that much it was only a minor loss so they got some points for their board and it meant that even though both teams had won one game and lost one game we had won harder so we actually won the first round hooray so first round in the bank and the team has got an overall win under the belt we are smashing it but now we have to go into round two. Round number two, I am paired with Mark and his Dark Angel Dreadnoughts. And we play in two Imperial Guard and Grey Knights. And this was a really interesting matchup because 
we didn't have the firepower advantage. We had kind of planned to have the firepower advantage and we didn't because the Imperial Guard players list was Gaunt's Ghosts, three Lima Rust tank commanders with the Marsha cannons and another Lima Rust tank with a Demarsha cannon. That's an insane amount of boom boom. And his Grey Knight teammate had gone for more of the objective play. So he had a Nemesis Grandmaster Dread Knight, and then he had a big unit of Purifiers with Crow, and then a unit of Terminators with Drago, and then there was a unit of five of the Jumpy Dudes, the sort of Strike Marines that can jump around. I think they are the Interceptors. Now for the mission, it was Sites of Power. That's where you have to have characters on objectives to start getting bonus points. You still get three points for each objective that you do hold. Deployment was Hammer and Anvil. And speaking of deployment, the guard guy put all of his Lieben Russes on the line and made it very clear he was going to drive forward and shoot us in the face. However, I think he did make one small mistake in his deployment. He spread his Russes out. He had one on the right flank, two in the middle, one on the left flank. I think a better move would have been to take all four Russes and completely overwhelm one area. He had fire superiority. He, he outshot us when he was concentrated. But when he was spread out, he only matched our firepower. And they kind of gave up one of their big advantages. The Grey Knight player basically had everything just at the back waiting to start jumping up and down in the sky. As for Mark and I, I put my Basilisk and a Chimera on the right flank. I had a Tank Commander and a Chimera in the middle. And then I had a more, a stronger force on the left where I had a Chimera, a Sentinel and the Lemurus Exterminator uh, over on the left flank. Mark went bang in the middle. He put Azrael on the objective with his bodyguards. And then he had the Dreadnoughts, the Dark Shroud, all that just in the middle behind Lancet blocking terrain. Our plan was to bait the Lehman Russes forward, the demolishers, do some damage at range to them, soften them up, and then when they got close, jump out and do as much damage as possible and have a big smashy turn, including a turn where the Dreadnoughts could not only plasma, but could also fist those tanks. Now Mark and I went first and our beginning turn was quite cagey. I brought some of my left hand units over so they could have a nice firing line and I took advantage of my longer range. I had my exterminator autocannons that could fire at 48 inch range, basically only four shots but still, and I had my sentinel with a las cannon and a hunter killer missile uh, which also got a long range and so between these shots and a little bit of fire support from the basilisk we were able to actually take one of the Lemurus tank commanders down. So it only had about five or six wounds left, which was pretty good for an opening, just tentative bombardment. We were also able to pick up some secondary points because we did get investigate signals and we got our two back corners, but we also drew assassinate, which we wouldn't get this turn because we weren't able to kill one of the tank commanders, which was kind of expected, but we kept hold of it because we knew we'd probably get it turn two. It then goes over to our opponent's turn one and they kind of do what we expect them to. The Lehman Russes mostly power forward, the one on the right flank and the two in the middle. They haven't got any targets, they're not in range of anything, but they need to start moving forward so they can bring those Demarsh cannons to bear. The one on the left flank actually goes backwards and that's because they drew investigate signals and he was the only one that could do that. And at the end of the day, points being prizes. They managed to get two investigate signals because they had the Grey Knights on the other flank. And then that was really it, that was their turn. So after a very quick battle round one, we get into the second battle round and Mark and I initiate our plan. The enemy has moved forward. There's a good opportunity for us to get some DACA on them. I'm able to destroy the injured tank commander, but in return, it does fire at us and it manages to kill the Sentinel. This actually got our opponents no prisoners, which is one of the secondaries that they drawed in their first turn. So that was kind of cool. And it was a great example of how don't underestimate tank commanders. If you kill them at range, they are going to blast you back. And with Demarsha cannons, that can make a hell of a punch, a hell of a bang. We were then able to really, really badly damage one of the other tank commanders. We got it down to one wound. This was thanks to Mark basically oath of momenting it 
and just pouring all of these dreadnoughts in. I have to say he was a little bit unlucky. He probably should have cleared it, but he was able to uh, take it down to one wound and it was degraded. So it's a Lima Russ that's now hitting on fives, which isn't good at all. Even though we hadn't quite done as much damage as we wanted to, we hadn't had the dreadnoughts get into combat. So they were still kind of safe, you know, getting cover from like the Dark Shroud and minus one to hit from the Dark Shroud and all that kind of stuff. And we'd also done really well on the points. We had got a little bit of prime at the beginning of the turn. We'd managed to get assassinated by killing one of the tank commanders and we got a tempting target. And we'd pushed forward onto all three primaries. And we'd done so with enough units where we were like, you know what? Even if the enemy hits us back, we should be able to hold most of these primaries. And this time we didn't need two units, one from each player to hold an objective to count as having it. The Adepticon twist was if you have one, a unit from each player on that objective then it becomes sticky but we weren't really that bothered about that going into our opponent's turn two the Lehman rust that had been doing signals moves forward but we know that it's not going to get into the fight till turn three the other two Lehman rusts also drive forward and now they've got some targets but their firepower is greatly diminished. And despite the fact that our opponents actually got bring it down as well in the secondaries, and despite the fact there was a number of like chimeras and stuff that were knocking about, they don't get a kill. And that's because the first tank commander was hitting on fire because he was degraded, and the second Lemurus wasn't near enough to the tank commander to get take aim. He'd sort of done a bit of a misplay. He started sending it really down sort of the left flank. And so when it went to shoot, we popped smoke. So both demolisher cans were hit on fives, and that meant that the vast majority of their firepower went completely wide. Don't get me wrong, we didn't skip through them bombardment unscathed, but by the time the dust had settled, two chimeras were injured. They were down, but they weren't out. And then the Grey Knights did a really, really spicy maneuver. They took Crow and the Purifiers and they deep shot them down three inches away in our deployment zone, and they were able to get a line of fire on Azrael. And they wanted to go after Azrael because he's giving us loads of extra CP each turn, and also he was worth adept on victory points because there were tertiaries like Warlord and First Blood. And they unleash the purifying fire, they unleash the flamers, the storm bolters, everything. All the mine bullets and the regular bullets, all the mine fire and the regular fire, and they don't quite manage it. Mark rolls like an absolute fiend on his saves. I think there might have been an arm of contempt thrown in there as well. Maybe. I don't know. I'm just guessing off my head. And um, either way, he is able to tank it. He doesn't, Again, he doesn't get through it unscathed. Azrael is left alive on his own. And that's it. Maybe there's like one bodyguard on one wound. But Azrael is basically left alive on his own. But he does not die. And so our opponents have kind of gone for a big turn two. And the demolishers haven't connected. And their purifiers haven't quite achieved their mission. And because our opponents hadn't quite dislodged us, going into turn three, we get 12 points on primary. We actually hold all three in the middle and we hold our home one, which is a nice big primary boost. And then for our objectives, we get overwhelming force and behind enemy lines. With it being turn three, it's very easy for us to get behind enemy lines. Mark had some scouts in reserve. I had my Cyclops in reserve. So we bring both of those in, max up behind enemy lines. And for overwhelming force, um, there is one, one of the marsh tanks is like driven on to like an objective. Uh, and so what we end up doing is just blasting. And this really was, I think, the big swing turn. In the mid board, in the firefight that was happening, we destroy one of the Liam Russes, tank commander, and it does fire back and it is able to get, bring it down. It is able to get some points there because it does finish off uh, one of the injured Chimeras. And then we fire into uh, another Lehman Russ and we very, very badly injure it. So it's another, so we're not quite picking up two Russes a turn, but we're basically picking up a Russ and a half each turn. And then in the backfield, we managed to pick up pretty much all of the purifiers. I have a Basilisk with take aim with heavy that can just see them. So it's hitting on twos and it's got D6 plus three plus two shots for the blast. 
And even though they've got true silver arm and all this kind of stuff, I'm able to get fields of fire off because we've still got Azrael. And so by the time that the Bazaar has fired, and we've had two Chimeras that have fired, most of them have had some kind of like X-ray P going off and this, uh, that and the other. And we've also had Azrael who's fired and then he's charged in. By the time it's settled, the only one that is standing is Crow and he's left on one wound. And he promptly Foxtrot Oscars away at the end of our turn three and so when the get to the end of our, our third turn the kind of units we, we've lost are like the bodyguard for Azrael, but not Azrael himself the chim a chimera here and there a sentinel and what the enemy has lost is two lima Russes. there's one that's basically down and they've just lost a big uh ba basically a big gray knight unit so it's not completely in our favor both sides are taking horrendous losses but the losses we're taking are kind of like sacrificial things and the losses they're taking are meaningful units turn three for our opponents was really their last hail mary they get the injured demolisher right into our face uh, because i have engaged in all fronts they're like screw it i should get into those table quarters and then the one that i've been signaling finally in turn three gets back into the fight and they are able to do some decent damage i do lose the exterminator this time uh, even with pop and smoke my opponent just rolled like an absolute beast definitely made up for it maybe his his tanks are getting used to shooting through smoke at this point and so i do actually from the from my army i at the end of my opponent's turn three i'm down to a chimera with the squad inside of it another chimera with the squad inside of it one squad one tank commander and a basilisk. I've lost my sensor, I've lost my exterminator, and I've lost uh, a chimera. And Mark takes an absolute beating because Drago comes down and is able to uh, actually finish off Azrael. Drago and his boys, basically the same maneuver as last time, come down and finish off Azrael. And, uh, and Mark's also, both of his dreadnoughts have taken some heavy fire uh, from like spare, like multi melts and stuff like this. And uh, they're not dead, but we're, we're, we're feeling the pain. And in fact, on our opponent's turn three, they had driven us from the right-hand objective as well. So they had a really good surge on turn three. But Mark and I have a bit of a dastardly realization. Our back objective, the one they're trying to take off us and deny us some primary, is stickied. Because my tank commander and Azrael started the game on that objective. And as per the Adepticon twist, that's ours. And as per the Adepticon twist, for the opponent to unsticky it, they need two of their own units on there. And the Grey Knights are there, like Drago's there, but the only Guardian that could possibly get over there is Gaunt's Ghost. And Gaunt's Ghost and the Nemesis Dread Knight were the ones that push us off the right-hand objective. So if we can kill Gaunt's Ghost this turn, and yes, they are low not, but if we can kill Gaunt's Ghost this turn, then that objective will be ours, and our opponents will have a bunch of Terminators that are kind of just out there at the back. I'm sure they can start jumping up and down again, but... They won't be able to really engage with any of our objectives. We can start sticking them all up. And so that's what Mark and I do. We put a Dreadnought and the Infantry Squad into, into sort of the middle of the board, sticking that objective. And so we've got two that are sticky now. And we basically abandon our home base. And I take the Infantry Squad that was in the middle and I conga line it forward. So the two Flamers are in range of Gaunt's Ghost Unit. I take the other Chimera that I've been with the Basilisk in the backfield. And I power that forward and I get that within 12 inches of Gaunt's Ghost so I'm able to flame and shoot them as well. And then I take the Basilisk and I, li I, I literally move, move, move the Basilisk with my tank commander order so it can go far enough forward so it can get within 12 inch range of Gaunt's Ghost as well. It wasn't a Basilisk, it was a goddamn assault gun this time. And so our turn, we finish off the injured basic Lehman Rust. So there's just one uh, tank commander left at this point. And then we also pick up Gaunt's Ghosts with all of the Flamers, like four Flamers and a Basilisk just going into Gaunt's Ghosts. Even though they're stealth and everything, the Flamers also hit and they are only really toughness three models. And so we actually managed to wipe the whole unit out in one go. I got quite lucky with the number of Flamer shots. I rolled like a six and a three with the first couple of Flamers and then I rolled a double six with the next couple of Flamers. And the final wounds were actually done by um, a, a, a hail of an accurate lasgun array firepower, taking the last wound off Gaunt himself. On top of this, the Grey Knight Jumpy Dudes had come down to do some cheeky objectives, some engage and stuff like that, and we were able to get them as well. 
So even though we only killed like a couple of small units this turn, it really hampered our opponent's ability to take any of these sticky objectives offers. And we had sticky two or three of them at this point. To put salt into the wound, we got bring it down and deploy teleporter home, which we were able to get by killing the basic Russ. And we still had the Cyclops bimbling around the enemy backfield. So he got the teleporter homer. And so we've got a big lead on points uh, at this stage in the game. Our opponents go for one last push, but the writing is on the wall at this point. We are outscoring them. We're trading blow for blow, but we are outscoring them. And so they are able to destroy the Chimera on my right flank with the Nemesis Dread Knight between sort of shooting and charging and whatnot. And then they're also able to do a bunch of damage with Drago in the backfield. And they do take a home objective, but they can't hold it because it's not sticky. And then it gets to, that's really it. They score a few points here and there, but we are just pulling so far ahead on the primary. It goes round to turn five. There's only about five or ten minutes left on the round timer. So uh, in our turn five, Mark and I go, we score our primary because we've got three sticky objectives, draw our missions, extend battle lines and cleanse. Boom, boom. We do those very easily because our objective is still sticky. So we still hold the home objective and we've got two of them in the middle. And that was it. And then our opponents do their final turn points and they get like defend stronghold and attempting target and we pick an objective they just can't get for attempt target and they do get some primary at the end of the game they are able to hold like the home objective and they also hold the one sticky one that's not in the middle that we don't have but the final result of the game is 56 points to our opponents and 80 points to Mark and I, with the big swing being that we had uh, more primary than them and we also were able to max out our secondaries as well. Mark and I did a very, very good job of just being where we needed to be and just getting all of the points that we could possibly get. We sacrificed a lot of our army just to do just enough damage, but to really focus on getting those victory points. And when you look at the table at the end of the battle, there was very little left on each side. They had a Dread Knight and a Terminator unit and a Lehman Russ. And I had a Lehman Russ and like a Chimera and a squad. And Mark had like two Dreadnoughts. That was it. There really wasn't much left on either side of the battlefield. So a really, really good game and the cherry on top being that Simon and Chris won their game as well. They had played into World Eaters and Orcs and they had actually picked fixed objectives for behind enemy lines and deployed teleporter homers. And they'd done a really cool plan where basically the guard, they baited the enemy forward on the first two turns. Uh, and then Simon sort of turn two, sort of turn three had teleported everything into the enemy's back lines so that suddenly they found themselves sandwiched and they were losing like their home objectives and all that kind of stuff and they maxed out their secondaries and the guard basically held the line and distracted the orcs the world eaters whilst the grey knights went around and scored all the points and whilst the guard did get a bit of a battering they actually had a really really big win on their table as well which meant overall we had two major victories so going into round three we were feeling pretty confident we just won our first two rounds but like icarus we flew too close to the sun our arrogance was to be our downfall our folly and when the round three pairings were announced we were on the upper mid tables we were at table number one. Oh, mama we did not belong up there, let me tell you. I knew it was going to be bad when I saw our opponent's lists. It was all Space Marines, and it was basically all Ironstorm Spearhead. They had built their army so that it didn't really matter which player paired with who. It was always going to end up with the same outcome. A 2,000 point normal list. A little bit how like when Chris and I paired up, it was just my 2,000 point guard army. They'd done that, but they'd made sure that it didn't matter who paired with who, it was always going to come out with near as damn it, with a bit of variety, the same result. Now, in this round, Simon and I paired up. So our list was my guard and his dread knights. 
For our opponents, they had a Land Raider Redeemer with Hellbrecht in it, with a unit of Sword Brethren, and then they had uh, two Gladiator Lancers, a couple of other Gladiator tanks, I'm not sure exactly which ones, and then they also had two Redemptor Dreadnoughts with the Plasma Cannons, and they had Azrael, who was sitting at the back. So theirs was a combination of Black Templars and also Dark Angels, sort of Iron Storm Spearhead goodness. The mission was Take and Hold. The twist was Chilling Rain. I don't remember the Adepticon twist. It had absolutely zero impact on the game. And the deployment was Search and Destroy, which is the Table Quarters one. For deployment, I had my Scout Mirrors up front. And their plan was to essentially, if we went first, to start Scout moving and taking objectives early on, playing it very cagey and using the terrain to our advantage. At the end of the day, our opponents have got a lot of direct firepower. Simon deployed all of his stuff at the backfield and so he could start jumping up and teleporting around and I took my Lehman Russes and also my artillery and I put that defending our objective as well, ready to try and sneak out. If our opponents got a little bit frustrated because we were playing so cagey and our plan was to be the cagiest cages of all cage town. We were kind of hoping that our opponents would move forward, maybe make a mistake and so we'd be able to pounce on them with some counter-attack firepower and some counter-attack charging Grey Knights and stuff like that. As for our opponents, they put the Hellbrecht Mobile and one of the Gladiators on the right flank. They then had the two Dreadnoughts with a Tech Marine, I believe, going down the middle. And then they had a two more Gladiators going down the left flank. And they had Azrael, who was just sat holding their home objective. They also had a unit of the Infiltrator dudes who were making a big 12-inch no deep strike denial area. Now, their captain won the roll-off, and he made us go first, because he didn't want Simon getting all of his jumpy nonsense going around. Turn one, I basically took my scout mirrors and moved them so that they would be holding the objectives, even if they got blown up. Our opponents didn't have a huge amount of combat punch outside of the Hellbreak boys, and so my hope was that he would use enough firepower to crack open a chimera, and the guards would be able to spill out onto the objective and hold it and stay out of line of sight. The only points we got this round was investigate signals, which we did with something in our back corner. Our other objective was bring it down, and we bin that off at the end because we suspected that we weren't going to get it turn one. Our opponents weren't going to make it easy for us to go after any of their vehicles. To be honest, if we had gone second, we might have kept that, and that's because... If we got second, Simon could have jumped stuff up and then turn two, we could have dropped down and maybe got a tank or two. But as we couldn't do that because we'd gone first, that's why we decided to get rid of it. For our opponent's turn one, they played it quite cagey as well. They didn't go balls to the wall, which is unfortunate because we really wanted them to so we could counter punch. But they were clever. They were experienced. They weren't on table one by accident, unlike ourselves. And so they just took what they could. They drew cleanse, and so they got cleanse. They drew assassinate, they couldn't get it, they just binned it off at the end. And in terms of their targets, they just quite simply put a gladiator into each one of the chimeras that they could see, blowing them up, which sure meant that our infantry were still holding the objective, but de-mecking us and just trimming away the targets that they could trim away safely without overexposing themselves. Our turn to... We actually controlled three primaries, so we got a lot of points there, and we got Defend Stronghold, and we were also able to cleanse. So we actually got all of our points without really having to do anything else. The only firepower of note was over turn one and turn two, I had been firing into the infiltrators that were screening the back line. And by the end of turn two, I was actually able to get them. So that meant that the deep strike denial zone at the back had been taken care of. Unfortunately for us, our opponents had a similarly good turn. They only held two objectives, their home one and the one in the middle, but they did draw no prisoners and overwhelming force. And sadly, because I'd had two units of infantry that I just sat there, cleansed the objectives, they were easy game. And so those two objectives were almost completely achieved just by killing two 10-man infantry squads. But going into round three, Simon and I were actually beating our opponents on points. We basically matched them on secondaries and we actually beat them on prime because we'd held three to their two. And we hadn't lost all that much. And now the border started to open up a little bit 
because our opponents had moved out, they'd spread out a few gaps that appeared, and the Grey Knights could start going to work. Our turn three was still a big scoring round. We managed to pick up 15 points. We control one objective and we got behind enemy lines and extend battle lines. So because we managed to open up the board a little bit, we were able to teleport a Dread Knight forward onto one objective, meaning that we were able to take it. And we'd also been able to get a unit terminated and my Cyclops into the back lines so that we could get the behind enemy lines as well. So we actually scored a lot of points, but if I was to make one criticism of us here, we didn't go all in. Benefit of hindsight, this was the big turn where we should have pushed out and hit them now that the infiltrators were down, and we didn't. We were still in KG mode. In fact, the only real killing that we did this turn was one of Simon's Dread Knights had dropped down behind the enemy lines and was able to pick up Azrael, who was defending their home objective. So we did manage to get their Warlord and deny them some CP, but we didn't really do any damage. And if you look where we are at the end of turn three, we've killed what like a five-man unit of infiltrators and we've killed Azrael. there's really not a lot of damage that we've done to the enemy i'm sure we've not taken much damage but killing isn't all that important in 40k we've, we've lost a couple of armor fist, fist squad and that's about it but we have ceded quite a lot of control of the board and this really from turn three onwards is where our opponents began to run away with it they got 15 points for primary matching our good primary in one of those rounds and they got a tempting target because they held all three of the middle objectives at this point sure we stopped them from getting defense stronghold but that was about it and because we had not been aggressive in our turn three our opponents were aggressive in their turn three Helbert and the boys using the land raid assault ramp came screaming into our backfield and they actually took our home objective offers and they only killed 10 guys from doing it, but now our opponents are literally sat on four out of five objectives. Sure, they're not holding the home one, but they've taken our base one. And they've got a tempting target, they've got loads of primary. Our turn four, we don't get any primary, it just consists of us killing Helbrecht and his bodyguard, which does get us some no prisoners. But then our opponents, they get max primary again their turn four. They're able to deploy teleport to homers, they're able to use the land raid to capture the enemy outpost. So, and they're just battering us. They're just battering us. And we're not, you know, we're, we're not losing much. We're not gaining much either. We're losing like a unit or two a turn, but we're, not, we're basically not touching their army. And so going into round five, we were able to control our home objective to get some points. Uh, in fact, ironically, in our turn five, we drew Storm Hostile Objective, and the Hostile Objective we stormed was our own home objective because it was the Land Raider which, <laughs> which had controlled it. So we hold our home one, uh, we storm hostile objective, uh, we get deployed teleporter homer. Oh no, I think it was another, sorry, there was another objective that we stormed. We like yeeted off a, a unit to go and get it. We deployed teleporter homer, and yeah, that was really it. We, we got a few secondaries, but after basically being neck and neck with our opponent, turn three on the points, turn four, turn five, their primary domination really really kicked in and so our opponents ended up getting 90 points overall and we only got 60 but if you look at the breakdown of points our opponents got 40 on their secondaries and we got 35 so we were pretty bloody close to them but the real big difference was the fact that they got 50 on their primary and we only got 20 so seeding that middle ground the first two turns was the right move but then not going balls deep and counter punching them and being a bit cagey and being a bit passive and being a bit scaredy cat that's what cost simon and i the game it was a very difficult matchup i do think nine out of ten times that list beats our list but i think that if turn three we had taken everything Simon had and just overwhelmed one side, destroyed two of those gladiators because they're not that tough. And then turn four, gone over and done the same thing on another flank. Maybe we could have kept them off balance, but we were too afraid of losing our units. And we should have remembered that you can lose 95% of your army and still win games of 40k. So definitely a big lesson learned there. So Simon and I lost our game, but we still got a few points out of the points differential. And then Chris and Mark, unfortunately, didn't fare much better. Although they actually put up a really, really good fight. They were a bit more aggressive than us. And they came away with even more points than we did. And actually had the Space Marines a little bit on the ropes. But sadly, they just could not stand up to the level of firepower that was coming down range at them. And so 
Their army was definitely battered and bruised, but they came away with their heads held high. And overall, I think our team did pretty well. We had no real business being at table one. We were very much going there for the casual play, but we were able to go and get a few points out of it. And rather than coming away with both of our sides getting 20 nailed, we actually came out with some points. So a good game and our first taste of bitter defeat in this tournament. But it's not over yet. That was just day one. Now we have day two. So after day number one, our team had lots of food, lots of beer. We had a good rest. And then we got into day number two and round four. And Simon and I were going to be paired up again this time. And we were facing off against double chaos one plague marines one death guard and one world eaters and their list was real spicy i, <laughs> I thought this was this is a tough one so they had on the death guard side some plague marines they had typhus and some pox walkers and like mephetic blight hauler and then mortarian so it was infantry and a demon primarch and then on the World Eater side, they had Eight Bound, they had Berserkers, and then they had Angron. That's right, not since the dark days of 8th edition and the wacky ally system have we seen the possibility of taking on double Demon Primarch at 2,000 points. But this is doubles, baby, and this kind of thing can happen. And so Simon and I, we had a hell of a fruity fight on our hands. The mission for round number four was purge the foe. So you get points for killing something, get points for holding objective, and you get points for killing more and holding more objectives. For the secondaries, both sides pick fixed objectives. Simon convinced me to go fixed objectives. I've never gone them before. And we went for deploy, teleport to home, and engage in all fronts. He wanted to have the same kind of plan that he'd had in his round two when he had taken on the world eaters and the orcs the idea was we would draw them upon our lines and then we would use the maneuverability of the grey knights to start scoring lots of boys teleport homers and stuff like that our opponents also went for fixed secondaries and upon sighting all of our tanks they went for bring it down and upon seeing the fact that they had more infantry they went for cleanse as their second fix so it was like playing ninth edition it's all fixed all the way baby for our deployment i put an armored fist squad on the right flank and i put an armored fist squad in the middle and I put a Sentinel and an Arm Fist Squad on the left. I also had my Lemurus Exterminator over there as well. And in the middle, I had my Tank Commander, so it was positioned 12 inches away from the Lemurus Exterminator and the Basilisk, which was hiding behind line of sight. We didn't have a lot of enemy firepower that we needed to worry about. The Plague Marines were packing heat. Don't get me wrong, they've got all the plasma and the melter and this and that and the other. But apart from that and one Mephetic Blight Hauler, their firepower was 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 little it was really about up close and personal for them with plague marines having lots of special weapons and also combat weapons and of course the world eaters just being all choppy all the way now naturally sir we went first this time simon and their captain rolled off and their captain didn't want the gray knights doing all the jumpy stuff so he made simon and i go first our turn one was pretty straightforward. We were able to uh, drive forward, I was able to scout move and then move forward with the scout sentinel and an armored fist squad. And that got me line of sight onto the Mephitic Blight Hauler. And then I had deployed my exterminator really far up on the left hand side. And because it's kind of like pointy ham and anvil, that meant I was able to actually move it 10 inches forward and get line of sight using one of those firing lanes. GW train, it's more open than you think. Straight on top of Fittic Blight Hall. And between the four auto cannon shots from that and its hunter killer and its heavy stubber and the lads cannon from the Sentinel and its hunter killer and the Chimera's weapons, I was able to bring down that Mephetic Blight Hauler, which allowed us to kill an enemy unit. Other than that, I just basilisk the eight bound because I was like, huh, don't want them running at me, causing all sorts of issues. And Simon was able to deploy a teleporter homer in the middle of the board with one of his dread knights because he can like zoom forward with them. They're all teleporting and stuff. Uh, and he put one in the middle so that if the enemy moved close or shot, I think it was Grandmaster, he could just go, you will never get this. And he can just teleport away. And we got engaged in all fronts as well because, well, my chimeras were on the flanks doing their scout mirror things. 
For our opponents turn one, they use a unit of Plague Marines and World Eater Berserkers to just screen out the backfield. This is kind of a win-win for us. If those units come at us, it leaves the backfield open. Simon can go to work. If those units stay back, well, that's two units we're not having to deal with, and we can use our range firepower to pick them off at our leisure. Over on the right flank, a unit of Plague Marines and the eight bounds start going towards my scout mirror that was over there. And then up on the left flank, Mortarian and Typhus and the Poxwalkers slowly start coming towards my little armoured push that I'm doing with the Exterminator and the uh, Sentinel and the Chimera. And in the middle, they push another unit of Plague Marines forward and also the Death Shroud. They had a little three-man unit of Death Shroud. They don't quite make it onto the objective, but they're going to start getting their sort of turn two onwards. Their one chance to uh, kill a unit is actually with the eight bound, but the eight bound have been slowed down between the movement and the advance and then the charge, they'd actually lost six inches of movement in a funny sort of way. And so what should have been a four inch charge ended up becoming a 10 inch charge. And even with a reroll, they don't get it. Now this is a really big deal because it meant that even though we'd only killed the Mephitic Blight Hauler, they hadn't killed anything. So we got a bonus four points at the end of round one because we had technically killed more. Going into turn two, I use my left hand armored push to pick up the pox walkers and also to pick up typhus. I was a little lucky on the typhus, I'm not going to lie. Essentially what I did is I yeeted all of the exterminator stuff into the pox walkers and was able to basically scythe them down, getting within sort of 24 inch range. And then that gave me the extra AP. And so when I started firing things like my heavy bolters and stuff from the Chimera, I was still AP minus one overall, uh, which meant that I was able to get a couple of wounds through here and there. And then a LAS cannon and two Hunter Killer missiles from the Sentinel and the Chimera meant that I was able to get those connections with rerolling wands and stuff from the Daring Recon. And so Typhus probably shouldn't have gone down, but two Hunter Killers and a LAS cannon and a heavy bolt and a whole bunch of other stuff did take them down in fairly short order. Moving over to the middle, we seed that territory. We decide that we want to basically concentrate on the flanks. And so Simon goes Billy Big Bollocks on his turn two and brings down two Dread Knights. And he's like, I'm gonna get those eight bound. But unfortunately, after he shoots every last shot he's got, and even with support from the Basilisk, the eight bound don't go down. In fact, our opponent is really, really hot on his saves. And so Simon is forced to charge in with one of the Dread Knights. In fact, both Dread Knights to get the job done. Now, this was a really big deal because it meant that Simon was no longer behind the protective screening, anti-deep strike screening of my guard Scout Mirror. And so even though we held an objective and we killed a unit for Purge the Foe and we did great on engage on fronts, we got all four engaged at the time because we were able to like deep strike some Terminators three inches into the enemy back line and they were deploying teleports. We got loads and loads of points. Our opponent's turn two was a real big slap in the face, a real shot across the bow because they were able to hold an objective and they were able to start cleansing and then they started bringing things down. They got two Dread Knights in one turn. So what happened is the units that were sort of moving towards the center redirected. Like So there were two units of Plague Marines that shot into one of the Dread Knights. And that one was at long range and one was at you know, close range. And sure, Dread Knights are like big and beefy, but they're only toughness eight. So one just got shot to shit. And it was in contagion range and everything. It just got shot down. And then the next one got picked up by Angron because now that they weren't behind the anti-deep strike screen of the guard, Angron just dropped down and he has like an eight inch charge because he can like make his charge better and he there's like a CP reroll going on and he makes a charge and he just picks up another Dread Knight, no questions asked. And so Simon took a real punch to the gut that turn and it definitely made us sit up straight. We were like, okay, we've got a proper game in our hands here. We need to be getting our head into the game. Going into turn three, we are able to hold one of the objectives, which gets us four points. And we take stock of our situation and we realize that the right flank, where we had initially been planning on operating on both flanks, has kind of been lost at this point. The only thing over there is a Chimera with some Guardsmen and it's facing down Angron. 
and we could redirect over there with our remaining two dread knights and stuff but all of our other firepower is on the left and sort of near the middle and so that would be we'd be spreading out we'd be losing our force concentration so i say to simon simon change of plan we need to completely dominate on the left seed the right and just deny the middle and he's like okay let's go for it so on our turn three they've only got one unit holding the middle objective now they had this, the blight laws because the other turn the other plague moves have come down to deal with the dread knight right so we get two of our dread knights and we put them into the death shroud in the middle i have a tank commander with long range firepower to support them as well the one with the battle cannon and stuff and we were able to get rid of those death shroud that meant they didn't have a unit that could cleanse the middle objective didn't have a unit that would be in range to cleanse the middle objective and it also got us points because we killed one unit so we got four primary we're still able to engage in all fronts because they hadn't been able to quite kill all the terminators those plague marines and those worldies that have been screening out had dogpiled them but two of the terminators had lived so that meant that we got engaged in all fronts also with it being turn three and the fact that the Plague Marines and stuff have been, and the world has been pulled away from holding the, holding the home objective. I brought in the Cyclops Demolition Vehicle, which got me deployed Teleporter Homers. And then I had engaged on the other side because I still had my Chimera facing down Angron. So we were doing really, really well on the points. And we had denied them some points as well because uh, we knew we'd taken out some of their cleanse too. So our turn was basically kill the Death Shroud, and we put a bunch of firepower into. Uh, Mortarium, we were able to bring him down to uh, about 10 wounds and we just scored lots of points. That was our turn. Their turn three and they have a really difficult choice to make. Over on the right hand side where Angron is, there's only Angron. That's it. He was the only unit that could cleanse that middle objective. And so that, that right objective I should say. And so there's a really big dilemma for our opponents. Do they just have a Demon Primarch sit there cleansing, which gets some victory points, but it doesn't feel good? Or does Angron go ham and just start charging around, destroying everything? Our opponents are fun guys to play against. And they decide that what would Angron do? Angron's not going to sit there pressing the button and cleansing. Angron's going to go and choppy choppy. So this turn, he basically picks up the Chimera, and uh, the infantry squad. I think the I think the Chimera goes down to some. Uh, they've got like some spare long range firepower. But anyway, the Chimera and the infantry squad over there basically die on turn three. And then uh, Mortarion slowly buzzes over on the left flank. So we've got a demon Primarch on each flank now, and he flubs it. And this isn't actually uncommon for Mortarion. He, he, he I've seen him whiff more often than he hits. He goes in against the Chimera, doesn't kill it. He just doesn't get the wounds through that he needs to get through. And so, you know, he's only got like sort of five attacks and wounding on sort of hitting on twos, wounding on threes. Um, I think I get like a save against it. And so the Chimera lives on like one or two wounds, but it lives and it doesn't degrade. So it's happy. It comes over to our turn four. And we're like, OK, we need a big push. Or a chance here. Let's take it. The Demon Primarch. Mortarion, he's injured. If we can take that out, we secure the left flank, and our opponents have got very little that they can redirect to the middle. And Angron has clearly abandoned the right flank. So that's what we do. And our turn four is pretty straightforward. We put everything we can into Mortarion, we bring him down to uh, basically next to no wounds. And then Simon charges in with his Nemesis Grandmaster and is able to finish the job off. Is able to bring Mortarion down. Uh, that, that Nemesis Grandmaster gets all sorts of crazy like anti-demon stuff. And he's just got like rerolls from combat. I don't exactly know how it works and I might be misremembering. But uh, the Grandmaster single-handedly, well I'll say single-handedly, uh, after, <laughs> after shooting him and having to exterminate and everything... Um, he does manage to bring down Mortarium, and that does secure the left flank completely. And so going into turn four for our opponents, all they've actually got left at this point is a unit of Plague Marines and a unit of Berserkers in their backfield. A unit of Plague Marines that are moving on to the uh, right hand, the, not the right hand objective, the middle objective. That's kind of an Angron. Angron turn four 
I screen him out so that he can't charge our home objective because he's very, very fast and got 22 inches to turn if he wants to. And so he basically munches on another infantry squad uh, and Chimera. And then turn our turn five, we sweep into the armored fist. The armored fist of the Imperium sweeps into the home objective because the left flank's been dominated now. There's no more time over there. And I've still got a Chimera and I've still got my Exterminator. And now I've got a Nemesis Dread Knight helping me out. And so we just pour onto their basically home objective, clear away those Plague Queens, clear away those Berserkers. And the end of turn, uh, that's our end of our turn five. And their turn five, they've literally got Angron running around. And he, you know, he batters. He's, they've got Angron on one unit of Plague Marines. Plague Marines have cleansed, turned their turn four, their turn five. And Angron manages to just pick up one more vehicle for them for bring it down. But that's the end of the game. And so at the end, both sides were pretty battered and bruised. But they had really struggled on the points. If you actually take a look at the final points here, uh, Simon and I got 87 uh, on 87 victory points to their 58. And we got 50 on Purge the Foe. So we maxed out primary. And then for our secondaries, we only dropped two on Engage and we only dropped one on Teleporter Homer. Uh, by the way, there was no battle ready points um, in a disc because it was all done by the tertiary, like the, the Slay the Warlord and First Blood. And our opponents did actually quite well on Purge the Foe. They did get 32 points on Purge the Foe, but their secondaries were really bad. They only got six on cleanse. And if you notice throughout, if you go back and watch that game four again, you'll notice that they're basically just cleansing one objective at a time. If I, they, they said afterwards that they realized that cleanse was a bit of a bad call because bring it down was one that required them to be aggressive, but cleanse was one that required them to be defensive. And so whilst bring it down was fine for the world eaters and cleanse was fine for the plague marines together, they weren't really working their armies together. If you notice like the left flank was all the Nurgle, the right flank was all the world eaters, where Simon and I were constantly interlacing our forces. So I think Simon and I's coordination was a big help there. And I, but I do think our opponents pick and cleanse, uh, that definitely hamstrung them somewhat. As for Chris and Mark, they had unfortunately lost their game, but not by very much. They'd done very, very well on the points, but they admitted afterwards they kind of fouled up their deployment and they had to spend the first two turns sort of rearranging things. And unlike the Grey Knights that were on my side, they can't just like teleport around or sort of get around a bad deployment. Uh, but they were able to do very well and they were able to get a few points out of it. So even though they lost kind of like in the first round, this big win that Simon and I had had made up for the minor loss that they had. So overall, our team won round number four. And so with another victory in his name achieved, we go into round number five. I'm not going to lie to you guys. It was a massacre. Call an ambulance. Call an ambulance. But not for me. So... Our round five opponents were absolutely lovely, but they had had a buy in one of their rounds, in their last round. And in Adepticon, if you get a buy, it means your points, uh, you get a full 20 nil win on both tables. So they had like 40 points. And so their win had kind of been, their overall performance had kind of been pumped up. And so they were probably higher on the tables where they should have been. And we go into round number five, and I'm paired with Mark. Now, bear in mind that Mark and I have got a lot of very tough vehicles. He's running Redemptor Dreadnoughts that always count as being in cover and um, a mass one to hit because of the Dark Shroud. I've got Lehman Russes. I've got Chimeras. We've, we're just all armor all the way. And we're not just like shooting armor. Thanks to those Redemptor Dreadnoughts. We've got Punchy Punch as well. We look over our opponent's armies this pairing and we're facing chaos chaos are pretty cool army they're pretty good but i look at our opponent's models and something hits me right away i'm thinking where are the enemy tanks and then i look closer and i think never mind where the enemy tanks where is the enemy anti-tank our opponent's entire anti-tank 
consisted of two Reaper auto cannons. Bear in mind, Reaper auto cannons are not really anti tank. They're strength seven, AP minus one, like one or two damage. Not like the big auto cannons like the guard get. So they had two Reaper auto cannons and a plasma cannon. That was their AT. That was their long ranged AT. Their list in total it was a Black Legion uh, player and a Word Bearers player. And the Black Legion player had 700 points in the big Abaddon blob of Doom. 10 Terminators with two Reaper Water Cannons and Abaddon. He then had two units of Warp Talons and I think a unit of Cultists. And then the Word Bearers player had the Hellbrute. Two units of Possessed, one of which was in a Rhino. One unit of Legionnaires led by a Dark Apostle. And a unit of Cultists. Something like that. There might have been some Nurglings stuff thrown around as well. That was their army. And so I just turned to Mark at the beginning of the game and went, we're going we're gonna to armor push them. We instigated the Chris protocol from game one, where we looked at their army, they've got no anti-tank, so we're just going to push them to the middle of the board and set up the firing lanes and blast them as they come towards us. And to make matters worse, we took fixed secondaries. I voluntarily took fixed secondaries for the first time in my 10th edition career. And we took cleanse because we just sit on the two middle ones and cleanse them. And we took deploy teleport to Homer because we're just going to sit in the middle with all of our tanks and just deploy teleport to Homer every single turn. Our opponents took tactical objectives. But honestly, if you've ever seen the old film, The Patriot and the Battle of Camden Fields, kind of reminded me of that scene. Bad's a damn fool. Spent too many years in the Adeptus Studies. Going muzzle to muzzle with the Imperial Guard in open ground is madness. Battle was over before it began. We got turn one. Because we always get turn one. Because <laughs> Simon won the roll off and made us go first so he could jump up and down. And our deployment was Chimeras on the right hand side with the Dreadnoughts behind them. Chimera and all of my other guard armor in the middle. We basically seeded the left hand side. We just had Azriel down there screening out. We didn't even hide anything behind line like blocking terrain. Turn one, we scout move the armored wall forward. We get a Chimera on the middle objective. Scouts near the middle objective. We get two Chimeras and a Sentinel uh, on the right-hand side. And uh, the Dreadnoughts would push up behind. And my armor pushes up as well. Because it's GW terrain, because we're playing, uh, I think it's Dawn of War deployment on this one. It was Dawn of War. There's really good firing lanes so we just open up and turn one we can see a rhino with the possessed in it and uh, we we crack the rhino open with some indirect fire and uh, sentinel hunter killer missile and all the chimera firepower this forces the possessed to spill out and then they get hit by two dreadnoughts with redemptor plasma cannons they all die all of the the possessed go down and so in the middle, we've taken out the, the only... We've taken out the only fast-moving threat in their entire army. That's it. In fact, you know what? The Bazus wasn't even needed to help kill the Rhino because the Bazus went after the other unit of Possessed and slowed them down because they're infantry. So it's minus two move and ransom charge for them. Our opponent's turn one. Abaddon moves forward, but he goes like five inches because he started on the board. Cultists move forward. The Legionnaires move forward. The Legionnaires actually move. And then they've got... I'm not sure if there's a strategy. Maybe we just missed just how fast they could go. But they moved and charged. And managed to kill the, one of the Chimeras in the middle. That was the, that was their turn. That's what they killed. And over on the left-hand side. The Slow Possessed and the Cultists and the... And the Hellbrute move forward. To try and take the middle objective. They probably should have played a bit cagier. But they move forward into open ground. In front of a Basilisk and two Leaving Russes. So in our turn two, we put our firepower into it. the Legionnaires in the center basically went down to the remaining Chimera and the infantry squad. And then there, I also put one of the tank commanders into them as well. So that, just, that picked them up because there's only 10 Marines at the end of the day. And then over into the uh, Possessed, uh, we dropped the Exterminator and we dropped the basilisk and i think maybe even a cheeky like redemptor was able to like stick its plasma gun around the corner and get some shots off as well so the possessed died so it's just like one hell brute over there on the left hand flank the legionnaires have gone down and so going into their turn two they had the abaddon blob a dreadnought and two units of cultists 
and some shit in reserve. They don't bring their reserves in because they haven't pulled any secondaries that they want to get for like the teleporter home and stuff like that. Um, and then Abaddon moves forward again, but he's just sort of moving forward five inches at a turn using the line blocking terrain so we can't see him. But we know he's coming turn three. He's going to be there turn three. So, but that's that's their turn. They just move forward with a bunch of stuff and do zero damage. The plasma cannon from the hell brute just plinks off the hull of a Lehman Russ. Comes over to our turn three. Help goes down. Both units of cultists go down. And the only thing they've got left on the board at this point is the abandoned brick. Their turn three, they're, they're forced to bring their reserves in. But they bring them in. They have to be them in nine inches away. They're, they're, just, they're just being screened out by like chimeras and like Azrael and stuff like that. I think they do get an objective where they use one of their warp talents to basically do a secondary. Um, but the other one fails its charge. And the Nurglings sort of just scuttle onto an objective. The, the, the one objective on the left-hand side we don't care about. Abaddon emerges from the ruins and slams into, with his ch and charges the screening Chimera and Sentinel that's on that side. And he kills them. You know, that's fair enough. He kills them. But that's, that's kind of all he does. And then over into our turn four, the only thing that we've got to deal with is two units of Warp Talons, a unit of Nurglings, and the Abaddon Brick, and we're like, okay, well, Azrael and his bodyguard step out from behind the ruin that they're hiding behind, and they gun down one Warp Talon uh, squad, because there's like five of them, and uh, they charge the other one and kill that, so all the Warp Talons go down, and then turn, turn four firepower, everything goes into the Abaddon Brick, and kills pretty much every single one of them, and then the Redemptor Dreadnoughts charge in, and they're able to uh, bring Abaddon down to one wound, but they don't quite kill him. And then Abaddon strikes back and brings one Dreadnought down to uh, one wound. So he's pretty good in combat, Abaddon. But then it's their turn four, and all they've got is Abaddon. He's the only thing left. The Nurglings died to something, some incidental firepower, some Lasguns or some Chimera or something, some incidental firepower. And so their turn four consists of Abaddon. And he's stuck in combat with two Dreadnoughts. We get to fight first, so we go with the one with Dreadnought, but unfortunately we're not able to kill Abaddon. He just tanks, he just makes all his four up saves. There's like a CP reroll. And then Abaddon turns around and hits the Dreadnought, which hasn't killed him yet, which is the full wound one. And he does actually manage to kill it, but then it explodes. And the Deadly Demise takes the last wound off Abaddon, and the Deadly Demise takes the last wound off the one with Dreadnought. And so in one fell swoop, Two Dreadnoughts and Abaddon just disappeared in a giant fiery conflagration. And it was a great, really cool way to end the game. But at the end of round four, our opponents had been thoroughly tabled. Every last model of theirs had been purged from the tabletop. And the only thing that we had lost was two Dreadnoughts, two Chimeras, and a Sentinel. Our army was 90% intact. But it was a brutal victory and to, uh, the, to, the, the, to rub salt in the wound for our opponents and perhaps the cherry on top for us, Simon and Chris won their game as well. What was interesting, they actually played against all of the demon engines. So I feel like what might have happened is our opponents should have had one half of the demon engines with one half of the infantry, but due to the vagaries of pairing, because everyone has to pair with each other at least once somehow, basically all of the demon engines went together. So all of the armor and all the anti-armor was over facing Chris and Simon. But Venom Crawlers don't outshoot Lehman Russes, and Mauler Fiends apparently don't outfight Dread Knights. And so overall, even though it was quite a, a titanic clash of armor and a big old battle, they were able to cleanse and purge and destroy pretty much all of the demon engines and they got a big win for themselves as well and so with that we get to the end of round five and the end of day two and the end of the tournament and once the dust had settled our team had managed to go four and one putting in a very respectable performance overall i have to say i really really enjoyed this tournament it was so different playing in a doubles event and i'm looking forward and hoping to do more doubles events going forward it was just an absolute blast and i can highly recommend it that is the second time that i've done adepticon teams i did it obviously this time i did it two years ago and both times i would say it was the one of the best tournaments i've ever been to it's just fun playing doubles it's fun not just 
playing a game with someone across the table from you, but playing with your friends and fighting side by side and colluding and coming up with plans and trying to adapt together and bickering and bantering and all that good stuff. So really, really enjoyed the doubles event. And you know what? I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. Did you like this kind of format with the doubles? Would you like to see more stuff like this? And if so, what kind of pairings would you like to see? What kind of concoctions and combinations? Double Imperial Guard, Double Steel Legion with me and Simon, or perhaps some other factions as well. Don't forget to smash that like button. And if you like this kind of content, then subscribe to make sure you never miss an episode. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is your lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patrons you guys are amazing truly the lifeblood of the channel i could not do more doing glory full-time without the incredible and generous support of my members so thank you guys so much and last but certainly not least i want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patrons these are the war masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty. To a heartfelt thank you to Alex Dengal, Bon Bon Vert, Mad Larkin, Marcus Roberts, Mark Panconi, RJ Scorpion, Swordfish Trombone, Try Again Bragg, John Stubbs, Nick Wolf, Diesel Fox, and August Barney. Seriously guys, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Your support is incredible and it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much. That's all for now. Hope you've all enjoyed today's video. And of course, as always, see you guys next time.